start with Mongo. We go through. Have any of you guys worked with Mongo at all before, or fairly new to it? All right, so I'm going to do a combination of things. Um, I do a ton of talks. I spent three months on the road in the fall getting sort of bootstrapped in Europe. So they sent me to all sorts of fun places like, like Armenia. Um, so I'm sort of used to doing the talks and swapping in different samples and other things. So I want to talk sort of some of the infrastructure because there's, there's more to, I mean, there's more to any product than just how do I use it from the tool I'm using. And there's a lot of the, the concepts. So we'll talk about the concepts. We'll talk about some of the other things. And a lot of, you know, Perl samples and looking at how you interact with it in Perl and how it binds very nicely to how we're going to do things from Perl. So, um, as I said, I'm Brendan McAdams. I work for TenGen. We, you know, Mongo is a completely open source product. It's licensed under the AGPL. We maintain it. We support it. We employ most of the committers, um, training, commercial support. You know, sort of the typical open source model that comes around that. And... I spend a good bit of my time in addition to writing code doing this kind of thing of introducing people to Mongo, doing talks and evangelism and all that. Um, I'm trying to think, I've probably been working with Mongo for three and a half, four years. Uh, so, you know, as long as it's been around, I've probably been tinkering with it at this point. Um, and the question is, does my fancy click so I don't have to plug, I don't have to keep hitting the spacebar on my machine work? Apparently not. second here. I bet the battery's dead. Ah, oh, no, there's an on button that one has to push. Imagine that. There we go. Um, so part of the, the, the idea, at least the way that I see things, um, having done a ton of different languages, a ton of different tools and databases in the past. Uh, is there one more light yeah, on it over there? Sorry about that. I'm thinking about it. Getting, you know, it's, it's still, right. it's it's still right. early enough. There we go. Now I can even read my own slides. Now we can... Uh, yeah, no, that'd be that's fine. Yeah, I think it was just trying to get so that I didn't have glare on the slides. So, yeah, I've worked with a lot of different technologies and different tools, and a lot of times it ends up feeling like to just to get access to a data storage engine, we're jumping through hoops. When I first started writing Perl 15 years ago or so, you know, we stored everything, we stored all the results of everything we got from form submissions and DBM hashes, and it's a little primitive, but for a new programmer, for somebody just trying to get stuff done, it was also fantastic because you basically take the construct you were using in Perl, which is a hash, and you save it to something on disk, and then you have an admin program that can just open up the hash with every single thing that people have submitted to the form, and everything's in one place. And there was a lot that was cool about that. Of course, the ability to query it, to have complex analytics or anything else wasn't there, so you sort of eventually end up in SQL land, and this was as things like MySQL and Postgres were becoming big, and suddenly you can afford to use SQL without having to pay Oracle a fortune. Um, but it still doesn't always you know, complicate things. Inevitably, every language that has a SQL implementation ends up with at least one ORM to try to solve the problem. And suddenly you end up with an ORM that's trying to support 15 different SQL databases, all of which have slightly different features, and you're losing that abstraction because, hey, I need this MySQL feature, so I have to stop pretending that I'm on an ORM, and no longer do you have something that runs across everything. So what I'm saying, you know, our data store should serve our application, not the other way around. I should not be up till 3 a.m. banging my head on my desk because I can't get the database to work with my programming language. It should all just be one thing. And the database should be the second thing we choose because the most important thing is typically the language we want to work with, the language that our team understands. The database should serve that and be the, the thing underneath everything and just make our lives easier. So a lot of things that are still done with web applications. Obviously, it's a huge business now. Um, we need lightweight, high performance, and highly scalable data stores. I mean, trying to throw a, a stock Oracle instance in front of a website and doing a million, you know, a million requests a second, you'd be very, very unhappy. And the reality is, well, like with things like the cloud, we suddenly have commodity hardware. We have this ability to throw, I don't know, 50 or 60 web servers up that all serve the same application. But our bottleneck is almost always where we're storing the data, how we're accessing the data. And so we need a solution to that. That's a lot of what Mongo was designed around, is the concept of commodity hardware. Um, you'll hear that a lot from like the guys who founded our company. That was something for them of, if I've got a cloud system, I should be able to run something. Because a lot of SQL databases and other things need a lot of disk access. Disks don't perform so well in the cloud. Um, so a lot of 
What's across the, the board for all the NoSQL stuff is things like inexpensive cloud servers, horizontal scaling, you know, and not dealing with like slow disks with random failures, all of these other things. You should have a database that's as robust as the idea of just plopping a web server down. So what Mongo is, um, imagine for a minute you've built an application with a database. I know it happens very rarely these days. The question that inevitably comes up, I mean, we're going to build classes, maybe even if we don't build objects. In Perl, you know, I know a lot of people still mix things up. It's not going to be pure object oriented. But there's certain concepts we're going to organize into an object. Because the way to represent a user is probably an object or something that's object-like, even if it's just a hash. You can think of it as an object. So, and the question is, how do we map that object back and forth to the database? How do we get access to it in query? Going back to something like the DBM. I'm the type of programmer that I like just having my data structure represented in my language and represented in my database in some format that's easy for me to get to that looks similar on both ends. The question, that, or the answer that comes up a lot is just to use an ORM. And I mentioned that is this idea that we end up building layers and layers of abstraction to hide a tool that we've all admitted to ourselves we don't want to work with anymore because we can't make the SQL database do what we want to do simply, so we just keep building code on top of it. And we end up with more problems. Uh, I used to say it was two problems. People keep telling me it's n plus one, so however it lays out. For a lot of problems, SQL is a bad answer. You know, you think about the fact, like a hash, a multi-level hash in Perl. You've got to do a lot of work to serialize and deserialize that back and forth from the SQL database. You've got to break each piece up. You've got to define relationships if you've got a sub-document that has maybe multiple values or is an array or something else. And mapping that in and out gets really tough. So we're talking about sort of trying to force something that doesn't fit into the wrong shape hole, and then we're wondering why we can't get things out, why we can't scale our data store because we've built weird constructs that work around what the data store is supposed to do. Using RM is pretty much dressing a rabbit in lipstick and a uh, you know and an outfit. In the end of the day, we might have gotten it done. But what we wake up to in the morning is not going to be particularly pleasant. Um, a lot of times, too, I've found in projects I've worked on, the ORM is the biggest piece of technical debt. It lets us hit the deadline. And then it's the first thing that we're trying to reconstruct, pull apart, put back together again as we go through the motions of making the product go from being released to really being stable and capable and adding features. So we want to make our data work for us, get around ORMs, and then the question, too, is, I mean, a lot of these ORMs, they're hiding even SQL away from us. The ORM is deciding what the query is to work with things, and a generic query isn't always the right answer. You know, you may need to optimize something. But then again, if you step away from the ORM, and it gives you, a lot of ORMs give you the ability to, like, customize your SQL, well, then you've probably locked yourself back into whatever database you're in. It's not as bad in things like Perl and Python, where there are actually some really good ORMs. But in a lot of places, a lot of languages, like Java is a great example, something like Hibernate is horrific. It's, you know, the gibbering horror from beyond space time when you get down into it and then try to maintain it. So the, the sort of core concept of Mongo, I keep referring to documents, we work with JSON documents. JSON documents, when you look at them, they look a hell of a lot like a Perl hash. And that's really what they are. It's a hash document. It's an object with keys and values. Those values can be a number of things. And basically, you can break it down to we support scalars, we support hashes, we support arrays. The values of scalars in Mongo also has a bunch of type differentiations like integers and strings and dates and other things. So all of this complex information we represent can be mapped. If you've got an instance of a date object in Perl, the Mongo driver knows how to tell Mongo to save this as a date. So then I can open that back up in Perl and it's a date, or I can open it back up in Java and get the JDK representation of a date. So the obvious piece of a database, which is we don't just want to stuff a Perl construct in there, and you know, we want to put a Perl construct in, but also have other languages able to read this data. That's one big benefit of a database, is we've suddenly got something that everybody can work with. Um, we end up doing a lot of stuff with caching, I found in the past. When I deal with SQL, we throw memcache up to solve the problem because suddenly all these joins, these views, these one-off queries all really hammer on the system. And all we're trying to do is pull things back together into a database representation. We want to get the things quickly. 
and we want JSON data potentially or something that fits within our, our Mongo stuff um, or our Perl stuff, and we don't just want a dumb cache. We don't just want a DDM hash that we can't do any filtering with, we can't pull it apart and put it back together. So here's a sample SQL model. This is from, I did, for one of the Scala user groups in Philadelphia last year, they did like eight people speaking, each showing a different Scala ORM, because there's a ton of them. And so to, to give it so that each speaker didn't have to explain their model, here's the SQL model everybody's going to use, go ahead. Since I was speaking about Mongo, I use this as an example, and it's a good example of comparing SQL to what Mongo looks like. So this is a SQL model of what you might typically see, which is we've got three tables. Because a book here can have multiple authors. So the Demon Haunted World and Cosmos are written by the same author, which is Carl Sagan. And we also have some extra information that we can put in about authors. We've got a middle name, uh, nationality, and year of birth, which are knowable fields. We may or may not have those. So part of what comes up now is we've got a store. I mean, null is a storage item. It's something you have to put on disk. We've got to display it on the screen. But programming in Scala has three authors. And so this is really what's created this many-to-many -many table, which is suddenly, you know, we've got a map that a book has multiple authors. There's no nice construct in SQL for sort of nesting things internally. You're breaking it down into individual pieces. And it is, of course, normalized data. The first thing people do when they hit performance problems with SQL databases, they start denormalizing the hell out of them. So the first thing that's probably going to do when I hit performance problems is I'm going to want to add the author to each book. But if I've got multiple authors, it becomes complex, and you end up, I've seen people who create JSON columns or XML columns or put key value, comma delimited values in. And these are things that have happened. These aren't you know, sort of imaginings. It's the reality of uh, it's a database system that was designed 40 years ago to solve the problem of we have no uniform way to solve data. Not we have no way to scale our data or what are we going to do when terabyte disks are affordable and can be picked up at the corner store. Um, it's just how do we organize our information. So the joins get messy. Um, when you look at that, it's not always clear what the object structure is. Imagine one of these projects that we've probably all looked at with 20 or 30 or 40 tables. Half of them are nonsense tables. How do we figure out what is and isn't relevant? We have to flatten the object into three tables. If you actually do the count, there's seven separate inserts to turn programming in Scala into a SQL entry. And then we turn this back into objects. We go through the trouble of whatever our front end is, especially if we're posting JSON. And there's a whole bunch of extra work that has to happen. I, I would rather spend my time on something else um, other than fighting with a SQL database and doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, you know, one of the good things about being a programmer is the, the solution is supposed to be if we do something three or four times, we should be abstracting in a way so we don't have to worry about it. But if our abstraction layer is making things even worse, it doesn't solve the problem. So here is a rough representation of the same data in Mongo. And this is in the Mongo shell. The shell works with JavaScript because it's an easy way to do things. The shell is actually an embedded JavaScript engine. And um, it's just a JSON document, but it also, you can think of it as it's very much matching in some ways what you would expect from a Perl construct. Author, in this case, I've done as an array because we have the possibility for multiple authors, but all of this is in one place. There's no relation here. It's denormalized. Everything's in one place. Um, with Mongo, if you do a query against an array with a scalar value, it will and it will basically say, OK, do any of the values in the array match what you're looking for? And if they do, that document matches. So it makes it easy when you have one author or many authors to do a search for, say, every book by Carl Sagan. Even if he worked on five books, I don't have to do a regex query on a comma delimited author list to find out if Carl Sagan's in that list. I can break Carl out and do his own thing. The other thing is Mongo is schemaless in that there's no requirement for a schema. There's no necess necessity to save excess fields. So we don't have to show nationality is null here. We just don't have to do it. Um, we can leave that off. It's taken as red. If we know there's supposed to be a nationality field, yeah? I have two questions. Uh, the first is, when you store the same values for fields like Carl Sagan, um, and do multiple records, does it actually put that duplicated data on this? It does. So it's, it's, it is one downside, is that you really are denormalizing. Okay. Um, there are sort of patterns and techniques for managing some of that. 
Um, there aren't joins, but there are ways to create references across tables. So often what people will do is only store the information that they're going to need about Carl Sagan, for example, to display that document. Because what you don't want to do is fetch two documents to display information about this book. And then store the ID of the rest of the info about Carl Sagan from, say, an author's collection. Which then, if you want to click through and see all the biographical information about Carl Sagan, like if we had a copy of the Wikipedia article about Carl Sagan that we could show as a bio, which a lot of online book sites do, I wouldn't store that in here. It would be in another author's collection. But for the information that I denormalize, it would be local. Because to get the performance, joins are really the killer. And people aren't sort of used to thinking that way because it all happens behind the veneer of a database interface. But there's a lot that's going on. And so there is that. Um, part of the trick is obviously keeping things down, but also storage is cheap. Storage is incredibly cheap now that um, I think we're all still in that habit of thinking of storage as something we have to be really careful about, as opposed to storage is the thing that's going to save our sanity when it comes to performance. Well, okay. um, we're working with a lot of data at work. The second question is, when you're running a query on a deep value, is that fast? Yes. So, the way that it does things, it's actually, I'm sorry, you should clarify that as, as long as you index that field. Okay. So the one thing, and I don't know that I show it, um, is when you have these nested values, there's actually a syntax in Mongo for doing it. So if I wanted to get, if I wanted to match, say, let's say instead of looking for Carl Sagan, I want to look for every author that was born in 1934, I'd be query where author dot year of birth is 1934. And that dot notation, just like JavaScript, Mongo will automatically walk down the tree structure. It'll even walk through an array as if it's not there. Going back to that, Mongo will treat an array like a scalar value if you treat it like a scalar value. Um, if, you, if you ask for a dot for a field, Mongo finds an array. It then goes, oh, but there are documents embedded in here. So let's look and see if any of them have year of birth. And then you could index. So we could create an index specifically on author.year of birth, which lets us quickly get at this information. This is obviously more complex, which is looking at programming in Scala. So suddenly, I've got the ability, though, to fit three authors into one place. Um, because I don't have nationality or year of birth listed for Lex or Bill, I can simply leave that out, not clutter the screen, but also not use storage. Because as minuscule as it may be, Null does still use a bit of storage. Uh, and so this is sort of a representation. I could have actually, with Carl, just left author as a single document instead of having it in an array, because Mongo will sort of automatically abstract away the difference, because I'm always going to do queries against authors if it's a single field. And Mongo will take care of determining for me whether it needs to look deeper in an array or not. But as long as I've indexed that, it treats it performantly. Like anything else, there's no... The only automatic index, this ID here, is a primary key that's automatically generated by Mongo unless you set it to something else. Underscore ID in all Mongo collections has a primary key on it. Its index is unique. You don't have to set it, though. Object ID is an algorithm. It's a 12-byte system for basically generating a distributed key that doesn't require any locking or coordination on the central server. So each machine in your cluster can generate IDs independently, and they don't collide. It's a combination of things like process ID, thread ID, uh, MAC address, and timestamp, or something similar so that you don't have this locking mechanism where you're trying to, or you're calling last insert ID. We can get, at, I do have an example of this, I apologize. We can get at the embedded info. So I can specifically say, I want to look for authors where first name is Martin and last name is Oderski, and it drills in automatically. And if I index these fields, then it becomes really, really easy for us to get to that information. And so I get back that info. There's also updates. I'm going to go into these in more detail with sort of the Perl examples. Um, but we have a bunch of syntax with these dollar operators, like dollar set. Unfortunately, they get very confusing very quickly working with something like Perl or PHP where the dollar is used elsewhere. Um, but JavaScript uses dollar as a special indicator. So if you've used like jQuery, you've probably seen the dollar used a lot. So this is a, a more complex example of actually updating a document where I want to look for a book where the author is Bill Venner's. But because there's multiple authors, what I'm saying is I'm aware that there might be an array for authors. I only want to change Bill Venner's. And so what we've done is dollar set, which says instead of changing the whole document, just set one field. 
an author dot dollar company. That dollar sign is a special indicator that said it is basically, I know that company is embedded in an array. Take the document that caused this query to match, which in this case was the, the Bill Venner's document, and change just that. And so I can set the company on these guys. And I can also use a regular expression. There's some downsides to regex in Mongo um, because of the nature of B-tree indexes. A, a inde uh, regex that's not anchored at the beginning of a line is going to not use an index. There's going to be some things, um, but they are there, and they're capable of using it in a future release we're going to have on a full sex search engine. Um, regex anchored at the back? I guess that's not anchored, no, because of the nature of the B-trees. So it just won't hit an index. And if you anchor at the beginning and use a wild card, it'll use the index as much as it can, and then it'll do a partial scan. The trick in all cases, just like really any index optimization, although I find generally people don't know how to work with index as well and have to sort of go over it again, the trick, you're never going to get perfect indexes on every query in a complex uh, application. The trick is always to get to partial scans and scan as little as possible. What you don't want is full table scans. So we're, I mean, we've gotten away from joins. The other thing that we do throw out the window in order to do what we do is complex transactions. But we get horizontal scalability. So we go back to this question of I can spin up 60 web servers in Amazon right now, but the database is my bottleneck. I can spin up a system that's capable. I can spin up a Mongo system with multiple Mongo nodes easily and, and clearly that's capable of handling the load of 60 loaded web servers because we've got horizontal scalability. To do that, obviously, you can't really have joins where you're trying to figure out which of 60 database servers has a copy of a piece of data, and you can't coordinate transactions across these things. So it's something that we sacrifice. And we change our data model quite a bit. Because, but we get closer to what people are used to working with. A lot of these, you know, these are things that people deal with a lot. Scaling out, caching, high volume traffic. Web applications are a big piece of it. There's lots of people who are doing these for things that aren't necessarily web applications. Monitoring, logging, there's some other pieces of Mongo that I won't necessarily go into today that are really good for that. Um, if you're going to build a transactional application, a database without transactions is probably not a good choice. I, I, I don't know that I need to clarify that. Um, it's just the reality. I know in some cases, especially like Java conferences, people get really upset at the concept. But in a lot of cases, when pushed about what they use transactions for, they're really just using them as a self-protection mechanism. They're not really using transactions for anything other than I want to be able to roll it back if I make a mistake, rather than the business requirements are actually that we have a rollback mechanism because we have to be audited by the SEC that we're capable of canceling a transaction. It's just I've got transactions, so I use them. Um, if you don't need transactions, this is absolutely perfect. There's some stuff with business intelligence. There's better tools. Um, I know... You know, the Perl community, it's still sort of, you know, you build your own, you build what you can, you've got tools that can adapt easily. And there are problems that really require SQL. Um, one of which is I've worked at financial companies where the business analysts want to plug Excel into the database with SQL and go. And that sort of requires SQL when they're yelling at you, their SQL plugin to look at the data doesn't work. It makes it difficult to do what you need to do. A little bit of internals, and I'm going to skip over a lot of the big, I mean, I, I combine, end up combining a lot of slides for different talks and don't always go through all of them. Um, I'm happy to go through some of the information about like the details of things like sharding and all later. We revolve around memory map files. So the problem on like the cloud, for example, with commodity hardware is if you're trying to lock and sync to a disk every time you read or write, you're dead in the water in about five or six queries. And so we always we stick things like memcache in front of it, and then we're trying to manage two data stores, and hopefully the new guy doesn't forget to delete something from memcache when it's deleted from the database or update something. So instead, Mongo uses memory map files, which transparently lets the operating system coordinate what's on disk and what's in memory. We just work in virtual pages. And so this makes it really, really easy. The downside, of course, is um, RAM is going to be your big resource for Mongo. The more RAM you have, the more of your data you can have cached. What you want is your working set. The working set is like whatever data on a given time period is being worked with. You want to have that fit in memory. But because we have horizontal scalability, if you say we've got users, customers who've hit the limit on Amazon, where the biggest machine you get on Amazon is 64 gigs, they've got a working set bigger than 64 gigs, they can just add a couple more 64 gig machines and partition the data across things. And the partitioning is something that's built in and automatically managed. There is an underlying binary protocol called VSON, which again is one of those things we really want to drill down to it, um, is available separately. Uh, VSONspec.org, we have an EBNF grammar, grammar, 
everything else, um, if you want to build your own. Obviously, the Perl driver has the implementation of this. So I'm going to skip over all the fun and games about scaling, but the basic idea, because we are, you know, we, there's time that fits in. Um, we can take a single node. We also have a replica set system. Rather than a traditional master-slave, what replica sets are is they're peered. So there's still only a single master, but it's elected. So the idea with replica sets is with master-slave, if our master fails, we have to reconfigure a slave to become the new master. With replica sets, if the master fails, one of the slaves can be elected the new master, and your application is automatically notified when you fail over. And that's something that's built into Mongo. And so we can keep adding replicas. If we want to add write scalability, we also can add shards. And shards are horizontal partitions. And this is how companies like Foursquare have scaled their application. As their data grows, as their size requirements grow, they can just keep adding shards. And there are, there are deployments out there with hundreds of shards for one application. And a lot of cases on things like EC2. And I'm going to, we're going to, I'm happy to discuss the ins and outs of sharding uh, later if people are interested. So, you know, it makes me sit through all the animations as I fast skip through things. So now the important part, since we are at a pro conference, I should probably talk about a little pro. Um, apologize, I did not get a chance to color code these. The, the act of color coding things to get them into keynote slides takes about four times the time of actually writing the code, and that's generous. Um, so I just hit the point last night where it's like I can't actually get these to color code. I give up. So obviously, um, I've been refreshing my Perl lately and going through modern Perl, and it's nice to see, you know, to me now, I'm sort of convinced that that's the way that everything should be. Use the modern Perl module. Uh, I'm trying to remember, that brings in, like, use strict, use warnings, a uh, couple of other things, like requiring 5010, and the MongoDB module. So the MongoDB module is available in CPAN. It's just MongoDB. The typical installation of CPAN, or if you have CPAN min installed, you can do CPAN n, Mongo, get it in. There's a couple different ways to connect. So the easiest is just the default, which is MongoDB connection new. All Mongo drivers, Mongo has a default port, which is 27017. If you call in any driver for any language with Mongo, if you call a constructor with absolutely no arguments, it will connect to localhost 27017. Nice and easy. Um, with the Perl driver, there is not a connection pool, as far as I know. I checked that. Um, you have to sort of roll your own. Because threading is not something that's on by default, as far as I know still, we don't do connection pools. Some of our drivers do connection pools. Reusing things is very easy, though. If we want a non-default connection, we can simply pass a host name. It's host name and port. And with replica sets, uh, there's sort of two options. Because replica sets, I mentioned this auto failover, what you typically do is the driver has, you can either give the driver multiple host names so that it knows where things are, so if you, something's down, it can find who the master is, or you can simply ask it to find the master, which in this case is just adding an option to your connection that says, hey, this is going to be a replica set. Go out and figure out who's in charge right now. We also have a URI format, which we can use here. Uh, which is just really a list of hosts. It follows the sort of RFC spec for doing standard URIs. Because it's schemaless, the, the creation of databases and collections is implicit in Mongo. All you have to do is refer to them to create them. So if we wanted to work in a tutorial database, we get that off the connection and then a bookstore collection off of that. And that automatically will create them the first time we insert books. And this makes it nice and easy. There's no create table statements to maintain or anything else. We can just get up and running and get things going. So the creation of documents. In Java, it's really painful. It's a shame. I originally started using Mongo from Python and was horrified when I first started doing it in Java because it's not Mongo's fault. It's just Java. Everything's an object. There's no nice pragma constructs for doing something like this. But in Perl, Mongo documents are just hash routes. So whatever you would create as a normal construct for storing information in a Perl application, if you read a document from Mongo, that's what you're going to get. If you save that to Mongo, it's going to go to Mongo clean. So we have a representation of a basic book. We've got an author and a title. We've also got an array full of tags. And these are tags that relate to the book. So suddenly, because we can have arrays, 
and we can do this match with looking at things, we can just have a whole bunch of info about a book attached to it. Whereas in a SQL application, we'd have to either have a common delimited field, or we'd have to have a big lookup table that had all the tags people have added. The ID would be automatically generated here because I haven't done things. And it's really just collection, insert, and it goes in. That makes sense? Finding documents is a simple command called find. The default, if you were just doing a key equals value, is just that. You give it a document with the field or fields that you want to look for and the value, and it matches exactly. So if we want to find all the books by Brian P. Hogan, we just say to Mongo, hey, find me all the books where the author is Brian Hogan. I mentioned as well and showed you if you give it a scholar, but the field that you ask it to query is actually an array, it pretends like the array is not there. So even though the tags might field might be an array for every single document in the database, we can find every book where one of the entries in the array is Perl, and any book that has Perl in its tags would be returned from this query. And I mentioned as well, we can use regular expressions. So if I wanted to see, find all the books that had basically program star in them, I probably should have anchored that at the beginning, um, case insensitively. You can give it a Perl regex. The Mongo driver knows how to compile a regex from whatever language you're using down to something that can be sent to the database, and it runs the regular expression. So you don't have to use some special constructor for Mongo regexes. You just use the Perl regexes like you're used to using them. And then getting a little deeper into sort of all the different possible things we can do. Um, the dollar operators are for the query expression language, not to be confused with Perl variables. Obviously, remembering to quote these makes a big difference. Otherwise, you're going to be trying to use a variable that may not exist. So if I wanted to find all the books... Wait, wait, wait. wait. Oh, it should be single quotes then, right? You are correct. It should be single quotes. Okay. Except I wasn't paying attention when I went back through these this morning. Okay. But you're right. It should be single quotes, and I'll fix them before I publish the slides. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, it should be single quotes. And I'm sure I'll get a warning of some kind. So it's, you know, if I want to find all the books that were published between 2008 and 2011, if I want to say greater than or equal to, so I say the field name, and then there's a document with multiple values that I'm going to match against. GTE is the equivalent of greater than or equal to. LT is less than. So I can say greater than or equal to 2008 and less than 2012, and I get everything that fits within that range returned to me. So suddenly, you know, we still sort of have hash storage, but the querying that we would expect from a database. Some of the concepts from Perl that we're used to using, like exists, actually have an analog in Mongo. There is actually a special operator for exists. So if I want to find something, Exists will match two things. It will match where a field is not null and where, for, and where a field exists. So if you wanted to say where editor exists false, that would match anything where the field wasn't even set or where the field was set to a null value. Negation, there's an operator for that, so unfortunately we don't have a way of sort of doing a bang on the command line and just the any operator. We can deal with things. So when I do something like this, where it's GTE 2008, LT 2012, the default behavior of the database is that that's an and. So I'm saying where it's less than or equal to and it's greater than or equal to. Instead, though, there is an operator called or, which didn't exist in early versions of Mongo and was very frustrating. Um, but if we want to find all the books where MongoDB is in the tag, and then we're looking for two specific books, because two of my coworkers have written books that are out, one from O'Reilly, one from Manning. So I could say we're tagged as MongoDB, and one of two things. The publisher is O'Reilly, and the author is Christina and Mike, or the publisher is Manning, and the author is Kyle Banker. And that way I'm combining things. So regardless, just in case Kyle and, and Mike and Christina have written other books, for both options, the tag Mongo has to exist. But then I also want to discreetly sort of break down two possibilities. So these are statements that you can sort of think of how they map to SQL, if you're used to working with SQL. And all of these things are possible. There's also the equivalent of a SQL in statement. So if I wanted to find all the books where the tag was either HTML or CSS, I'm basically looking for all my WebMonkey books to give the new guy. Um, we can just do the dollar in. There's also dollar $n in, which would negate that. And there's dollar nor, which we do you know, not or. 
getting these documents back, because again, we're expecting to really get something that's a Perl mapped document or a mapped hash. Mongo gives you a cursor just like a standard database. So you don't get back, a lot of the NoSQL databases work over HTTP, and what they do is if you get a, you run a query that has 10,000 results, you'll get shipped 10,000 results all at once. And it's up to you to deal with the memory management and everything else locally. Mongo treats things the same way MySQL and Postgres does, which is that you get a cursor back. So you'll get a batch of, say, the first 100 or 200 results, and then an ID in order to ask for more results as we go through and keep retrieving more. So newer books is actually an instance of MongoDB cursor, which is just really an iterable object. And going through it, we can get each book by just invoking next, and that will automatically fail once that next operator is done. If we want to waste the memory, we don't care, you can convert that into a big array of hash refs as well by just invoking all. Make some sort of sense? Yeah. Cool. Um, updating documents. So updates are a combo of doing a query and a new document. The default for updates that almost no one uses because it's not very useful would be the document that you give it would replace whatever you update completely. Instead, that's where things like dollar set come from. So I actually, rather than having a book example, grab this from the tutorial for the Pro module. Um, what we want to do is we want to find all the users where their birthday is today or tomorrow. We're saying, you know, the query is birthday is greater than or equal to today, less than or equal to tomorrow. Um, and we want to set a gift to whatever the gift we bought them is. So we don't want to replace the whole document. We just want to update one single field, and that's where dollar set comes in. By default, Mongo only updates the first match, and so we would need to specify multiple here if we wanted to update more than one. We can also provide a bunch of operators to manipulate arrays. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but the good thing about arrays, they wouldn't be very useful if you had to fetch the whole array back to your Perl program, add things to it, and save it back. So instead, there's a push operator. There's also pull, pop, etc. All the things you would want to do to manipulate arrays. And this makes using arrays in Mongo absurdly simple and really, really fast. So we can say, find all the, all the users, or all the books, where the tag is MongoDB, and just add Perl to it. The only problem here is that push doesn't enforce uniqueness. So if Perl was already in the tags, we're going to have duplicates. So there is a different operator called add to set, which treats it as if it's a set rather than a list. Obviously, there's going to be some performance implications there. But if you want to enforce uniqueness, it's something that the server can take care of for you. Yeah? If the, if the addition value was an array and it had duplicates, and you were to say add to set, would it deduplicate that array? It would not deduplicate it. But if you use the pull operator, it will remove every instance of the value. Okay. So, I mean, typically what you would do is if you know there's dupes, you go through calculate a dupe sum, pull everything, and then re add it. Uh, and there's similar stuff for there's a push all and a pull all, so you can actually give it a list. Because if I did push with a list, it's going to push a list as a single nested value. So, push all would let me take a list or an array and push that in there. Because time is always a limiting factor in these kinds of tutorials, um, there's a whole bunch of other cool stuff that I'm happy to show you separately, like geospatial indexes, where it's built in similar to Postgres geo support. You can just attach, it's a standard index, it's a standard Mongo query with a special operator that allows you to look for things based on their geographic location. What I did want to show, though, is there's actually a very nice module called MongoDBX class, which is based around Moose and based around the Moose classes for doing what I think of as an object document mapper. This is not an ORM because we're not talking about relationships. And the nice thing with these ODMs is that they still give you all the power of Mongo, but they get around some of the fact that you still don't want to map stuff to an object. So working with hashes is all well and good until you have an object-oriented Perl application, and then people aren't going to be happy that you're replacing all your objects with Perl. So this example is right from the, the DBX class doc, uh, docs. And it's a little small print for the screen. But really, it's just a standard or a fairly standard Moose class with some extra things to define um, different types and how they relate to one another. 
And a lot of these ODMs, including this, have the ability for you to have an embedded field and tell it whether to embed it or to automatically store it in its own collection and manage that relationship for you if necessary. Um, again, I have a couple of things that are probably better for going through at another time. But that's the main body of what I have because I think we're just about on time. And it's a lot to absorb. But uh, what kinds of questions do you guys have? Are we on time for the original plan or for the later? It, I was supposed to start at 9.30, so I started at about 10. Okay. So I think I'm like, I got about five minutes for questions. As far as I know. Yeah. Oh, it's 50 minutes, right? 50, yeah. So I believe so. It's oh, we did all plus okay. minutes, yeah. Time for exactly. Which is why I was looking at the pace and skipping over slides, because mm -hmm. sometimes you never know. Uh, I'm trying to understand what you gain by uh, changing from, from, let's say, I have an application that has an, uh, a uh, MySQL database in the back end, and now I'm, I'm moving to MongoDB. Why? Because it, it can, uh, it, it's easier for me to uh, scan. Another, is, is a, a number of things. It's often data. easier for you to work with. Your data is going to fit better with an application. Especially if you've got front end where you're pushing JSON back and forth, right. you've suddenly cut out a whole layer of concept. Scalability is going to be another big one. Um, deploying and scaling MySQL on, say, Amazon EC2 right. is not really easy, especially if you start really getting hammered. But with okay. Mongo, it is. And Mongo is designed to just drop in to really a cloud type system right. and run and scale. So you can, add, you can have these replica sets for auto failover because I know how much we all love getting up at 2 in the morning to fix a failed master. Um, you can have sharding for sort of horizontal scalability that if you really need to add things, instead of trying to add more CPU, add more RAM, add bigger disks, you just add a second machine. And Mongo's auto sharding system will scale that out and spread that partition and spread the load for you. How would that work? How, how automatic is that? Uh, so I can actually, for that, I, the easiest thing to do is there's a pretty animation that explains it. I know that's not reassuring, but uh, it's sometimes the easiest way to explain it. Um, so the idea with sharding is it's automatic partitioning and management. So there is, there's a proxy that you would put in front of it. So if you deployed sharding, instead of connecting to MongoD, your app would connect to something called MongoS, which is a router. The MongoS knows what data is on what server. So to you as the user, your application shouldn't know or care whether Mongo is a single server, a sharded server, some new version of Mongo that I don't know about yet, that we have some other configuration that might come down the road, it should just know that it's connected to Mongo. So it is range-based. So you would say, if I sharded by username, we would chop that up. And so if there's four servers, right. the, the basic goal of the sharding system is that only 25% of your data exists on each of those servers. And if one server gets overloaded, the, the automatic management system will migrate pieces to other places so that everything's balanced out. And it's meant to be fully consistent. So you don't have to worry about eventual consistency, which is something that people get very concerned with when I describe this. If you write something, you, you read it back, and you can expect that it's there. Right. So we would, if we worked with you know, a minimum key and a maximum key, because there's nothing in here, let's just imagine we have a blogs collection. We're going to shard it by the age, in this case. We call these chunks. So these ranges of information are chunks. And this is a simplification of the view. Um, really, chunks would be about 64 megs. And we wouldn't split a chunk into bigger pieces and smaller pieces until it exceeded 64 megs. But so imagining not that we added one document, but that we added enough documents that we had to split things up. What would start to happen is internally, the Mongo system behind that Mongo S you're connected to would say, OK, I can't have one chunk anymore that's just everything. I need a chunk for minimum to 40 and 41 to maximum. So now we have two chunks. We have two logical separations of information. Because that separation of information is how Mongo tracks. If you go looking for something that's between 0 and 40, it knows exactly which server has it. Same thing, we keep adding documents and we keep splitting these into smaller pieces. We start with, if we start with one server, so let's imagine we have one sharding server. And some people do this. They know for a fact that their application is going to scale to the point 
or they need sharding. And so what they'll do is they'll start out with one shard server. I've seen people do it. It works because you're ready to go. It means that if you start hitting load, you can add a second server. So everything is in this one shard. But if I add a second shard, with you know, you just really run a command to add a second server, the sharding system then automatically says, hey, we've got two shards, but 100% of the data is on shard one. We need to fix this. And behind the scenes, there's a migration that will start happening where it will start moving pieces off to shard two. So the goal is essentially, really, we want 50% of our data on shard number two. And if I add a third shard, so each we'll shard is a, it's a server. It's a Mongo server. server. It's each either a serving. it's either a single Mongo server or a replica set. So the replica set right. gives you redundancy because if you know if you it's think about it like RAID disks. Right. You know, and friends don't let friends run RAID zero because you get lots of performance from striping them, but if you lose one of those disks, you lose all the information that was on that. So the typical production deployment is that this is a replica set where there's copies of the data in multiple places for each shard. But the logical separation is thinking of it as it's one server. And then there, you know, you've got this proxy between your application. So your app doesn't know or care whether there's three servers or 300. Everything is taken care of it for it by the database system. Make sense? Uh, I have data on uh, uh, properties in Florida, about 10 million, there's about 10 million properties in Florida, and I have about 10 years worth of data. Okay. And I'm thinking about putting it in PostgreSQL in the standard star schema dimensional model for reporting purposes. We're going to do research on it. How would, uh, is that uh, is that size about, so how would MongoDB be better? What way could MongoDB be That's an appetizer for Mongo. You're not going to have any problem. Mongo scales really well. Um, it's going to handle big sets of data, and if you, you know, and the nice thing is, if you actually hit a point where you have too much data, well, how would you, how would you partition Postgres? I guess would be the first question. And with Mongo, it's a very easy answer if you can break that up. But um, with that kind of thing, that's a very common type of like, you know, what we consider a large data set because you don't have to suddenly manage all these schemas and lots of relationships. You can organize things in one way. You can get to them quickly. You can manipulate them. You don't have to deal with the SQL stuff at all. You can just map it to and from Perl. And so for like the kinds of analytics you're going to do if you're building a Perl application, you, know, you could do a find, and you're just getting back Perl hashes and working with them however you want. Or if you use the DBX class stuff, you're just getting back Moose classes, and you can work with them in whatever manner you need to. So, I mean, I'm happy, too, if you, you, know, if you have deeper questions uh, to, to, sure to show examples or whatever else. Um, and... You know, we're always around. You know, it's, it's an open source product, so whatever we can do to help people with sort of adopting and going. No, no, we're just finishing up questions. I can't tell. Like, I can't tell sort of where the pace is of the global conference at this point. Thank you. Usually, like the next speaker walks in, and that's my cue that okay, we're done. Time to go. Thank you. So, absolutely. Thank you.